Namaste everyone. Welcome to my channel. Firstly, please excuse me for not posting a video during the week, but I actually wanted to complete the entirety of the geomorphology in this one video, which is why it took some time for me to prepare, but here I am. Anyways, let's get started to the video. Today we are going to complete the geomorphology, which means we'll be doing all the landforms and everything that is left so far in the geomorphology, so that in the next video I can get on to the climatology. So let's start. So uh, geomorphic processes uh, is what we are going to do in this video. Geomorphic processes has two types of uh, processes. Uh, one, in, one is the endogenic process and the other one is the exogenic process. Exogenic process is basically everything that happens outside the uh, surface of the earth and endogenic is everything that is in the interior of the earth. So in endogenic processes also there are two types of movements that are happening inside the earth. Uh, one is diastrophism and another one is the sudden movement. The sudden movement mainly includes earthquake and volcano. Uh, we have already done the revision of how earthquakes and volcanoes happen so I'm not going to repeat it over here. Diastrophism also we have done uh, most part of it. Uh, just a few more points is left. Points are left which I'm going to cover in this video. So in diastrophism there are uh, again two types of movements. One is epirogenic movement and one is orogenic movement. Orogenic movement is uh, is actually called uh, mountain. Orogeny is basically mountain building uh, process. So orogenic movements are movements that are responsible for building of mountains. So I'm just going to write down over here mountain building processes. So these are the mountain building uh, processes. Uh, so in orogenic movements there are two types of movements one is tension and one is compression compression is when there is um, uh, su uh, subduction or rather we call it uh, there is convergence as we saw that it is responsible for formation of fold mountains and uh, tension is when there is uh, divergence which is responsible for the formation of block mountains so these are the two orogenic movements uh, epirogenic movement is upward and the downward movement so there are times when the lava is uh, when the magma in the interior is going to try to pull the surface below which causes the depressions the great depression that we've uh, read about and there are sometimes uh, instead of depressions it's going to kind of push upwards which we will also study in one of the landforms later on so that is the uh, epiro those are the epirogenic movements uh, in uh, fold mountains uh, we did study about how uh, folding happens because of the geosync line but there are different kinds of folds that we need to remember uh, so if there is uh, equal uh, force from both sides that is when such symmetrical fold will happen but it is very rare that such a uh, you know symmetry is possible in nature you, it's not going to be able to have you know equal forces on both the sides so there are times when you know one uh, side is going to push more so if such a thing happens then such asymmetrical fold is going to happen which looks a little bent towards the side where there is uh, more uh, you know towards the side where force is being exerted then when the uh, force is even more and you know the tip uh, starts bending towards the other side that is when it is called overfold so it's not just asymmetric anymore it is bending much more towards the other side and if it is completely you know it's almost about to lie down on the other side that is that kind of fold is called recumbent fold so if the pressure is so much that it uh, you know the mountain uh, the fold is basically trying to lie down on the other side because of the force that is when it is called recumbent fold sometimes what happens is because of such a tension such extreme pressure this uh, fold right here uh, over here it, it might crack over here you, you know you might see a crack over here and it can just lie down on it completely the, there might be a fault that might form in the rocks such kind of it, it would be something like this if we see right here is the crack and that is why you know this is lying down over here so if we see right here we can see this is the crack and it would have been otherwise like this uh, so it is after the recumbent fold and this kind of fold is actually called over thrust so I'm just going to write that down over here this is over 
over thrust this kind of over thrust is also called as reverse fault so normal fault is when there is a uh, divergence and you know fault forms or a rift forms in the uh, on the surface of the earth but when because of convergence such kind of fault happens it is called a reverse fault so i'm also going to write over here that this is a reverse fault so there are be uh, three types of fault that we have gone through so far first is the normal fault which happens during divergence second is this reverse fault and the third is the transform fault that we also studied when there are transform boundaries so these are the three kinds of faults one more uh, fault that we need to see is the isoclinal fold isoclinal fold is when there is extreme pressure from both sides and they are equal so what happens in such a situation is that the folds will rise up it will be much more in height it will be very steep and uh, the folds will be parallel to one another so these are the isoclinal folds next we move on to the block mountains so in block mountains uh, there is divergence and because of divergence uh, under the gravitational force uh, these rocks some of these rocks they might go a little down uh, causing a depression so as such you know these might all be in a on the same level at one point of time but because of divergence there were faults that developed and in the in those faults some of the rocks got displaced downwards when that happens what appears is that uh, this is a raised area which appears like a mountain and this is called block mountain and these are the uh, valleys these are the downward valleys so uh, such raised part is actually called horst and the uh, parts which have gone down are called the graben so these are the two uh, features of a block mountain and as you will see here these are this is the normal fault right here so that's the normal fault next we study residual mountain residual mountains are all the kinds of mountains which have suffered through denudation for millions and millions of years and just uh, so it's it's remnants is remaining now you know it's they are not really in its original form and it's residual uh you know some rocks and some uh, places some peaks are remaining so these are called residual mountains aravallis are an example of residual mountains so uh, if we see right here in the diagram this used to be the original surface of the rock and now because of denudation years of denudation and weathering and erosion what has happened is that you know this is what is left of the mountains right here so the heights of such mountains is very less the rocks of these mountains might be very hard at this point of time because all the soft rock has been denuded and only the hard surfaces that are left are still you know intact so these are the um, residual mountains next we uh, study our pla uh, plateaus so there are two types of plateau one is an intermountain plateau intermountain plateau is a a plateau which is surrounded by mountain ranges on all of its sides so such a plateau is you know in the middle of the mountains a tibetan plateau is an example of an intermountain plateau a uh, fact uh, to know that a uh, tibetan plateau is also the largest plateau in the world uh, anyway a uh, next kind of plateau is the pidmont pidmont plateau pidmont plateau is a kind of plateau uh, which is which on one side has a uh, mountain but on the other side it could have land or sea so it is not surrounded by mountains on all sides that kind of plateau is pidmont plateau so this is pidmont plateau and this is intermountain plateau so now we move on to the exogenic processes in exogenic processes we go to weathering now weathering can be of three types uh, which is physical or mechanical uh, and then there could be 
uh, chemical weathering and then there could be biological weathering so what each of this these means so exfoliation is a kind of uh, physical weathering uh, what happens in the ex exfoliation is that because of the sunlight uh, uh, the temperature of the uh, top layer of the rock exposed to the sun might increase the minerals within the rock might get uh, you know expanded and then as the temperature lowers down in the night it get compressed and because of years of such expansion and the compression the top layer weakens and what happens is that only the top layer of the rock gets weathered and it gets removed it gets separated uh, and this is actually called exfoliation the next is frost wedging in frost wedging uh, what might happen is that there might be uh, frost or snow on top of a rock and uh, what might happen is that when the temperature is increasing the frost or the snow uh, might melt and it might enter the cracks of the rocks and uh, at night again when it is uh, you know refreezing uh, it might expand uh, within the cracks and it might increase the cracks and eventually it might cause in to breaking or the weathering of the rock so this is basically a uh, physical or mechanical weathering the next type is the chemical weathering chemical weathering the best example of that is oxidation when uh, your metallic minerals in the rock uh, reacts with the oxygen outside of the humidity and it forms into rust and it weakens the rock and that is called chemical uh, weathering and the third type is the action of uh, biological weathering. Biological weathering happens when there is lichens or there's algae of some kind or there are some decaying plants which, uh, you know, through its own actions, it kind of weakens the rock and it breaks it apart. So these are the different types of weathering. Now, because of these weathering, after the weathering happens, there's erosion and uh, erosion, then there's transportation and then there is deposition. So that you know the entire denudation process that we had studied earlier all of that uh, causes you know changes in uh, rocks and therefore changes in some landforms so what we are going to do is study landforms caused by different agents of denudation so river if we see uh, as a, when there is river uh, acting on some sort of a mountain or any form of landform what kind of other landforms are formed so that's what we are going to do so exogenic landforms first we are going to study river as an agent so in river uh, there are three stages of river so it is, it, it is not to say that when I say the young stage young stage does not mean the young age which it doesn't mean that the river is new river what it means is is that in its uh, entire flow it is at the stage where it has very high energy and speed. So it is coming right out from its glacier or from you know its source and it has just started to flow down the hill which is when it is at a young stage. It's not young age but it is at a young stage. And then there is mature stage when it basically reaches the foothills and you know the slope has reduced considerably so it might still be a little fast but it, it might not be very fa fast as it was in the young stage and then in the old stage it is nearly close to its end where it is going to meet uh, the sea and it is at a very slow speed it is not at all fast so these are the three stages of rivers and depending on its stage it's going to form different kinds of landforms so that's why it was important to know the first landform we study is the v-shaped valley this happens in the young stage of the river when because it is young it will have high energy and it will have high speed and that is why it is going to cut through the rocks directly and as it cuts through the rock this, this is how it might appear so we can see that there is a v right here what might happen is that it might do vertical um, uh, you know erosion and because of that because the rocks are exposed over here on the top uh, these the rocks also right here they might also uh, suffer weathering because of the sun's action and they might uh, eventually erode away and this is what it might look so right here is the v-shaped valley the next is a gorge 
as i had said earlier that we will see the upward movement uh, later at, uh, later at uh, another stage so right here is the example of an upward movement what might happen is that because of the uh, convectional currents uh, pressure the pressure might not be enough to cause a volcano but it might be enough to displace the rocks and you know create an upward kind of movement so uh, there might be you know some sort of divergence and along with that there might be an upward kind of movement so when there is divergence and upward movement in the divergence uh, some fault might develop uh, you know through which some uh, river might be uh, going so right here is that and uh, the upward movement will cause you know it to be like really high mountain or a valley kind of a, a feature and bit from between that you know there will be river flowing so this is actually called gorge so it appears something like this so if we see that you know there is there is clear it it, it it doesn't look like the river has made this path it looks like you know there is has there has been drifting and the river is flowing from between that drift so right here is an example of a gorge when such gorge goes through you know years and years of uh, erosion and denudation after that when you know it's going to expand and it's going to appear something like this so these are called canyons so gorge at a later stage may form into canyons next is a waterfall so what happens is sometimes there is going to be a hard rock on the top and there is going to be a soft rock at the bottom so when that is there uh, and when river is flowing through it it might erode away the soft rock first and the hard rock might stay intact which is why when the water reaches here it will fall directly in, uh, on the in the bottom instead of going through the uh, because it is eroded already so it will fall directly over here so this is called a waterfall now a uh, waterfall there are two more features to know in the waterfall the first one is uh, that of the plunge pool so where the water is going to fall it is going to uh, create a dip which is called a plunge pool and another um, feature that we need to see is uh, that of potholes which could also be found around waterfall so what might happen is when the water is falling and uh, it might be flowing somewhere around uh, you know certain small uh, sediments which are being carried in the water they might get accumulated in some dips and as the water is flowing through it it might uh you know get like it might get another kind of energy which might which might erode more of that rock and it might create such holes and they are called potholes so these are the two features associated with waterfall this is how a waterfall looks as we have we we must have all seen earlier but i'm still going to put here right here is the plunge pool and this is the fall next is a uh, cataract so what happens in cataract is that it is also a kind of waterfall but it is not exactly a waterfall so there might be a hard rock and a so right here if we see this is actually not for cataract but right here if we see that you know this is the soft rock and this is the hard rock but this is actually in a horizontal format so if there is a hard rock and a soft rock like this so if there's a hard this is a hard rock and this is the soft rock this is again a hard rock and this is again a soft rock if there is a formation like that and water is flowing through that the soft rocks is are uh, are going to get um, uh, eroded quickly and you know something like this might happen so there's a chance that right here there might be a soft rock which has eroded which is why there is like a stairs kind of a formation and this is actually called cataract next is rapids as i said uh, in uh, cataracts as there was a vertical uh, alternation between hard rocks and soft rocks in rapids there is a horizontal alternation between hard rocks and soft rocks so right here is a soft rock this is a hard rock soft rock hard rock and what happens is that when the water is flowing through this all the soft rocks will remain and the hard rocks will get uh, eroded and it will look something like this see the hard rock is still here but the soft rock is not there so you know it appears as if there is there are rocks in between and there are steps like this and the soft rock is all eroded the next uh, feature is a uh, penny planes so penny plane is uh, a feature where uh, you know everything is you know river is done with all of its erosion and you know some residual rocks and a full plane is all there is left of it uh the there might be a mountain range over here but 
now you know all that is remaining is such a plane and this is what is called a penny plane so it is a final erosion uh, after uh, you know everything is done after which uh, this kind of feature is formed next uh, feature is that of when the river is at its at its um, older stage it is not exactly in even a mature stage and it is not at all in its young stage so this is at an older stage so as the river is at an older stage its speed is decreased and which is why it is not going to make paths for itself you know it is not going to flow straight it is going to meander so this is what is called meandering when it flows in this manner it is also going to not uh, you know easily uh, cut through the obstacles it is going to meander and find its way through all the obstacles but it is still going to have certain energy of course because of its momentum from earlier and there is you know more water coming from the back pushing it forward so there is going to be some energy which is why it will erode a little so what will happen is over here if we see that as it is meandering it comes here and it hits this part of the rock when it hits this part of the rock it is going to erode from here and this part gets eroded and it keeps going more and more this side but that eroded material some of it will flow with the river but other will push back that some uh, this is something that we might have seen uh, at home also so if uh, we have a water pipe and if we uh, see that you know there is some dust um, you know near the wall and if we you know put uh, that water with force uh, on that dust that dust is going to you know bounce back towards us so that is uh, the kind of phenomena that we see over here as well that since the water is hitting this part of the rock it's going to erode and some of that erosion eroded material is going to come down over here and settle here so that is why this kind of meander is forming right here and this is actually called meander sometimes what might happen is that you know as this kind of keeps going here and here it it might keep moving here and then this might again keep coming here and eventually these two might meet so we can see something over here that you know this has met and the river forgets the uh, to you know go down there because it has found an easier path so it's going to fall uh, flow from here and this part over here is going to get cut off from the river uh, main river meander and this kind of lake is formed which is called an oxbow lake a uh, kanwar lake in bihar is an example of an oxbow lake so moving on to uh, the next landform which is uh, natural levees so natural levees is when uh, you know if we see right here that before uh, any kind of flooding happens a river is flowing uh, through a straight path but as when flooding happens certain amount of sed uh, sediments are going to Uh, get deposited you know uh, right uh, when the landform is right when the plane is starting so right here if we see and this kind of uh, you know sediment is going to get accumulated over time which is how water stays contained in its path and it is difficult for water to like even if it rises it might be stopped by these sediments and it might not eventually flood the plains so this is what is the purpose of levees and these are the natural levees which are built up by many many floods over the time so right here if we see these are the these are the levees if we see here right here is the river that is flowing and these are the natural levees formed next feature that we are going to talk about is alluvial fan now this is also a depositional feature i'm so sorry i've actually forgotten to me mention it earlier so natural levees is also a depositional feature because it is depositing the sediments over here uh, meander in oxbow lake here it is erosional and right here is depositional so uh, it is a combination of both and all the features before that the penny plains the rapids uh, the uh, cataracts the waterfall the potholes the plunge pool all of that the canyons gorges and the uh, v shaped valley all of them are the uh, erosional features so i i will be mentioning it from now onwards but uh, so far uh, i had forgotten to mention it so right here it, th that's what it is now alluvial fan is a depositional feature so as river flows down you know from the mountain and it reaches the foothill uh, some of the Uh, sedimentary material that is it has collected 
you know in the mountain uh, as it flows down from there it might deposit right here at the foothills and this depositional material that is left by river uh, at the foothills of the mountain is actually what is called uh, an alluvial fan or alluvial cone as well next is a uh, delta now this is the last stage of the river actually so as the river is ready to meet the ocean uh, it might uh, you know its speed might reduce considerably and it might not be able to carry any form of sediments anymore because it doesn't have the energy at all so since it doesn't have the energy whatever sediments it has left it will start leaving it right then and there and because of those sediments again since the water does not have energy it will not have it will not be able to move the sediments that are left then and there and it will try to you know form different paths around those sediments you know so it might kind of form a landform like this so these are all the sediments and river the water just you know tries to flow around it from whatever place it gets to reach the uh, sea so that's how uh, a delta is formed sometimes though that what might happen is that if the river does not have enough sediments because it has not created its own path by you know cutting through a mountain because it might be flowing through a rift valley or uh, if the continental shift uh, is submerged a little so it doesn't it's not there it there's no not much continental shift if the coastline is submerged into the sea at that time also such deltas might not be found because a delta needs a base of a continent to form which might not be available here so uh, in these two situations a delta might not form and river will directly meet the sea and this kind of a feature is called an estuary so next we study the drainage patterns of uh, caused by rivers so a river drainage pattern is basically how it flows how it meets its uh, tributaries and what kind of uh, uh, you know shape it forms so that's the drainage pattern so first is a dendritic pattern that happens when you know a tree like uh shape is formed by river and its tributaries so for example this is the main river and its tributaries uh, you know meets it like here this in you know form of a branch of a tree so so that is a dendritic pattern the next pattern that we are going to do is trellis so actually trellis and rectangular has a similarity and uh, you know we are be, uh, that that's why we are going to do a comparative uh, study on both of them so trellis and rectangular in both of these drainage patterns what happens is the river uh, is flowing straight and generally its tributaries are going to uh, join it at right angles it is going to form almost you know right angles right here that happens in rectangular as well uh, but sources have said like i actually it is it did not explain very clearly in the books so i tried to find it out to understand the difference between the two and i found out that mostly it is exactly the same that uh, the tributaries have to meet the main river at right angles the only difference is that in trellis the distance between two tributaries me uh, meeting uh, the main river is very less so what might happen is that you know right here for example right here for example is a mountain peak uh, mountain range and right here is another mountain range right here a river is flowing and you know from very every short distance a new tributary might be joining and that is what uh, might be the trellis and in uh, rectangular there is at a certain after you know certain distance the distance is basically more uh, between two tributaries so here also that has been actually shown in this diagram here if we see that there are too many tributaries meeting one river and here you know the tributaries are uh, you know far apart also the uh, tributaries also have their tributaries meeting them at the right angle so that is another feature that we see from this diagram but i again like i said couldn't find too much of clarity mostly uh, we might not find such options in the exam so trellis and rectangular the keyword that we need to remember is 90 degrees next is um, uh, centrifugal and centripetal so uh, centrifugal is also called radial drainage pattern so radial drainage pattern is when uh, 
you know many multiple rivers are originating uh, from one point source or from one mountain peak and it is flowing into different directions if we see right here might be a mountain peak and a river is going here or a river is going here 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 so you know this is an example of a radial drainage pattern whereas um, in centripetal uh, you know from all the directions the river or uh, you know there might be different rivers flowing in one uh, reservoir or one lake or something so uh, sometimes it so happens that in craters uh, that we studied uh, in the volcanoes uh, in such craters or calderas uh, you know huge lakes might form because of different rivers flowing you know all inwards in that caldera so that might be one of the um, uh, reasons of uh, such kind of a drainage pattern so this is actually not there in the ncrt so i'm not going to cover it but yeah these are the five important uh, drainage patterns so uh, we are done with the river as a agent of erosion next we do is sea waves so in sea waves if we see right here is actually uh, all the landforms are actually given here so uh, what uh, this is uh, for example this is actually called uh, sea wave, wave cut platform so uh, you know there might be a uh, you know hard rock and soft rock and some sort of a formation at the uh, sea and because of the action of the waves it might have eroded a little and it might still have its structure but you know there might be some form of erosion and you know such kind of all the soft rocks have been eroded and the hard rocks are still intact and this is actually the whole structure together is actually called a wave cut platform so uh, that is a wave cut platform uh, if we see right here is what it is uh, next feature that we need to remember is these hard rocks which are extending into the sea uh, they are actually called headlands so headlands are the harder parts which are not yet eroded they are actually part of the wave cut platform itself but the extending part in itself is called a headland and this these walls of such headlands is what is called sea cliffs so uh, we studied four things so far sea cliff headland uh, there is um, the wave cut platform and another feature is a beach which is a depositional feature so a uh, sea cliff and a headland is an erosional feature because it used to be a full rock but because of the erosion caused by the waves only headland and sea cliff is remaining and uh, this is the beach um, and again the wa uh, wave cut platform is also an erosional beach is only the depositional one so far so if we see that right here this is a headland right here is this the headline headland here we can see you know a bit of um, a beach and these walls are what are the sea cliffs next we study uh, the form called notch now what might happen is because of repeated action of you know waves on these rocks such you know dip in the rocks might uh, be, you know them might form they are called actually notches so if we see that you know the water action has uh, eroded this entire part of the uh, rock so it is called a notch it might further uh, keep eroding and uh, such caves might form because of uh, sea action so i will just mark over here that this right here is a notch then because of the further action by the waves uh, this will be formed which is called cave so right here is the cave and again the cave also might further get eroded and something like this can be formed which is called a sea arch so right here this is a sea arch now this part of the sea arch if we see right here the hanging part of it it might get subjected to further weathering because of the action of the sun and humidity and it might eventually fall off and some a structure like this you know might remain so you know there might be an arch sometime but because of the weathering it might have fallen down somewhere and this 
loan structure is remaining uh, which is called a uh, stock it is also called chimney rock so uh, this is that chimney rock next landform we study is uh, right here if we see in this diagram this one is what i'm talking about spit it is actually called sand spit or it is also called sand bar so what might happen is that as the uh, you know the ocean currents they are moving in a certain direction so even though they do get collided with the rocks but eventually its you know main flow might be in certain direction so the ocean current might be flowing in this direction and because of that it might carry along with it some sort of sediments that it has eroded from the rocks and uh, in the process of going you know uh, in this direction it might leave certain sediments on the way uh, you know if it kind of finds some sort of base so when it is finding the base it leaves these sediments and these sediments might eventually come up and form such sand spit or sand bars sometimes these sand bars might actually cover up two uh, headlands so for example this is a headland right here and this is a headland right here and it has covered up it has left the uh, sand bar right here and it is basically connecting the two headlands and when it connects the two headlands the water in the middle it stays inside and it actually is called a lagoon so this is what a lagoon lake is uh, it is actually formed by the action of um, deposition by the uh, ocean current so right here is what is if we see longshore drift so this is where the ocean current is moving and that's why it has left the uh, you know sand sediments they deposited the sand sediments over here and that's why it's formed a sand pit further the sand pit has connected two headlands forming a lagoon and this is actually called a barrier spit because it has it has created a barrier for the water to uh, you know join the ocean that's why it's called a barrier spit and sometimes sand spit might connect an island which is you know further in the sea not too far maybe pretty close but it might be connected because of this uh, sand spit and that kind of a sand spit is called a tombolo so we learned three words here there is a sand spit this is a sand spit but it has formed a barrier so it is a barrier spit and then there is a tombolo so and there is also a lagoon lake so these are the four uh, terms that we have learned here today and all of these are formed because of deposition of the sea waves so it's these are depositional uh, landforms so right here is an example of a tombolo right see if we see that this is uh, you know sand spit and it is connecting to this island of sorts uh, from this headland so uh, these were the landforms caused by sea waves uh, before we move on to the next agent we need to understand some of the types of coastline so let us look at the types of coastline first is a ria coastline now ria coastline is uh, could be formed because of you know action of uh, river and sea together so what might have happened is that because uh, you know the, the sea might be uh, at a very close proximity to the mountain so the river originating from that mountain when it's meeting the sea there's a chance that it might still still be in its uh, you know young stage it might not have reached its uh, its old stage because there's no time and because of that the speed would be very high and the area that is there right the coastline that is there uh, near the sea it might get eroded and flooded with river and you know such kind of uh, fragmented landforms would be visible and everything else is the sea water and the river water gets mixed at the coastline so you can't actually distinguish a separate coastline attached to the mainland uh, and you know uh, sea separately you will see that everything is submerged to get together so this is what is called a ria coastline next is that of a uh, 
fjord so this is a fjord uh, coastline so here also what happens is that um you know this is actually caused by the actions of a glacier so when a glacier is trying to meet the ocean it might uh, you know lead these kinds of uh, Uh, landforms and it's actually going to meet the ocean eventually so this is actually a coastline but there's also glacier here and that's why it is called a fjord next is dalmatian so dalmatian is actually uh, when there is uh, you know mountain ridges or ranges which are submerged in the water uh, in the sea water and only its tops the heads of it are visible so this could be a mountain range and you know there could be a mountain Uh, you know below the water under the water and it could be quite deep as such and the mountain would be quite uh, of you know of, of a great height as such but only its peak is visible because everything else is submerged in the water and this kind of a coastline is called a dalmatian coastline okay so we are done with the uh, landforms caused by the action of sea waves and now we move to the uh, limestone or the karst topography so Karst is actually a region in the uh, Eastern Europe region, and um, it's actually you know an area where there is uh, where a lot of limestone is uh, found, and there are different landforms formed because of the reaction of limestone with uh, different denudation process uh, agents. So you know it, uh, for example, we know that limestone is soluble with water. so it, it's it uh, gets dissolved and you know a new kind of landform is formed over there and that kind of a complete topography is what is called karst topography because uh, it was first discovered in this area called karst and which is why it is called a karst topography so it's this kind of topography is also found in the northeast area of india that's what uh, that's where i have been so that's what i know but it could be found in many other places as well so let's get on to it so in karst topography the first thing that we remember are uh, you know these sink holes so what happens is that since we all know that a limestone gets dissolved in the water so there might be rainfall or something because of which the top layer uh, you know at certain places it might get dissolved and you know a hole might be formed in the uh lime in the uh, you know surface of the limestone so because of that that kind of hole is what is called a sink hole now when th when that sink hole uh, is uh, gets a little bit bit bigger the in size that's when it is called a swallow hole when a swallow hole is even more bigger than it forms a doline and when the doline forms you know it that gets bigger in size it co it's called uwala and then when the uwala is you know it that also gets even bigger then that's when it's form that when that's when it forms polje so uh, this is the you know this is the um, chronology in which it uh, goes so the first there is a sinkhole then there is uh, after that there is a swallow hole then there is uh, do line after that there is uwala and then there is polye so that's the chronology so these are all the uh, landforms that we find on the top of the limestone now sometimes what might happen is that from this these sink holes you know water might percolate inside and it might go inside the limestone and eventually it might dissolve the interior of the uh, entire limestone um so not just the surface but you know the interior of the entire rock and uh, because of that you know these hollow caves might be formed so this is what is a cave and in the cave because the water is going inside because it is in the first place formed because of the water there might be an underground uh, stream that might be formed sometimes what happens is that uh, you know water is kind of flowing right here from the sink hole and it disappears in the cave so nobody can see from the outside so as such a person is going to be right here you know it might be somewhere he might be somewhere here or here or here also but he might not be inside the cave so you know the water is going in the cave and from within the cave it is coming out somewhere so it is suddenly the river that had disappeared over here you know that we couldn't see with our naked eye 
is reappearing here and this kind of a valley is actually called a blind valley or it is also called a dry valley because we see that the river is coming out from somewhere but we didn't know that where it was because it was within the cave so this is the disappearing stream and this is actually a blind valley right here from suddenly from nowhere the river is reappearing now as we saw that the um, as the that the water has you know had gone inside the cave there are chances that it might have formed some sort of um, landforms in the cave as well so uh, these are the landforms that are found within the cave so what happens is as the water you know as it goes down from the sinkhole from here if it is for example going down right here what might happen is that it might slowly slowly drip you know on the surface so for example this is the place from where you know the water is entering and it is dripping on the surface after years and years of such action what might happen is that water might go away but all the CaCO3 the limestone that was dissolved in the water it might get accumulated and eventually it might form something like this so you know there might be two um, you know such uh, forms that we might see a sharp you know drop like uh, in the in a drop like shape coming from the ceiling and a sharp uh, drop like shape uh, coming you know from the so this might not be as sharp actually because you know the water is falling continuously on top of it so this will be sharp but this will not be as sharp as such so uh, what happens is that you know these kind of forms are formed and these are actually called stalactite and stalagmite so how I like to remember is that the landform which is coming which is on the ground has a G in it. So that is a stalagmite. This has a G, so it is coming from a ground. Whereas this has a C, which is why it is coming from a ceiling. So that is how I'd like to remember it. And then eventually, when you know a lot of such action is happening, and then over the years, it might join. The stalactite and the stalagmite might join and form such a pillar. So this, this is actually called a pillar. So these are how stalact these are uh, stalactites and these are stalagmites. As I said, these are not as sharp right here if you see. These are not very sharp. Whereas these are relatively quite sharp right here if you see. These, these are a little broken now. So that's why it's a brittle thing. But otherwise, you know, the ones that are still intact that are at quite a height, they are still quite sharp right here. So uh, the, uh, these are stalactites and stalagmites. So we are done with the cast topography as well. Now we move on to wind as an agent. Now wind needs, uh, you know, space to blow to form a certain landform, which is why it is most active in open areas and generally deserts rather than in forests because forests has a lot of barriers. So deserts are the main areas and these winds basically carries particles and these particles collide with the rocks that are available in the deserts and they create abrasion. Basically it scratches it and that's how it erodes and it forms new kinds of landforms. So uh, these landforms are called erosional landforms and sometimes when it is reaching the grassland areas that wind will drop leave all those landforms in such areas and those are called the depositional landforms. So let's get to the wind landforms. The first landform is mushroom rocks. Now mushroom rocks are if we see that you know uh, here there, there might be a soft rock at the bottom and there might be a hard rock on the top. Also the fact that the wind when it carries a certain material it is going to be heavier. So the most uh, particles that it carries with it are going to be really close to the earth. It is not going to be above a, a certain height and which is why it is going to erode uh, the surfaces which are closest to the earth rather than the surfaces which are away from the earth. So that is why, you know, these kind of mushroom rocks are formed. So it has eroded from the bottom but not so much from the top and the bottom part might also have a softer rock so that's why there could be much more of an erosion here. So these are the mushroom rocks. These are the demoiselis or hoodoos. Now demoiselis is also you know a similar structure 
where you know it might be surrounded with a uh, hard rock and uh, 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 the hard rock might be surrounded with a soft rock on the outside and the soft rock is all ero eroded and the hard rock in its you know form plain bare form is what is remaining and uh, that is what is called a demoiselis so right here if you see these the, these are the structures this is exactly what is called a demoiselis or a hoodoo next is yardang so sometimes uh, the wind is uh, flowing in such a direction in in a parallel direction again it might be a residuary structure that these could be have been hills or mountains or something and all the soft rock is eroded but since the wind is flowing in this kind of a direction this is what is left of it now the parallel uh, you know structures are what are left and this is called a yard now the next uh, rock is uh, jugen so jugen is actually similar to a mushroom rock but just that the mushroom rock is you know a singular uh, one form and you know it's it its shape is like a mushroom whereas for a jugen it is formed in a similar manner but it is a little longer which is why it is called a table like structure so that is its keyword table like structures where the bottom is eroded and the top part remains that is called a jugen so jugen is an again an erosional structure of uh, wind this is also an erosional um, landform demoiselis as well and mushroom rock so these are the four erosional landforms of uh, wind next is inselberg inselberg is also another erosional landform it is uh, you know just this uh, remaining bit of a rock or a mount or a hilly structure that is you know just remaining after everything else is eroded that is what an inselberg is so it's uh, standing on plains everything else is eroded and just this remaining structure is there uh, the next two structures are mesas and butes so in mesas and butes uh mesas is uh, is actually the larger butte so that's how it is this is a mesa and this is a butte so what is there in this is that this right here is the soft rock so in the bottom there is a soft rock but it is held together because of a hard rock on top of it so it is still getting eroded eventually but it is still intact in its form because of the hard rock which is holding up so so that's what a uh, butte is this is a butte which is a smaller version of mesas and if we see that these are the hard rocks and they are holding the soft rocks underneath it the next is dry canter so dry canter is a piece of rock which is probably lying in you know in the middle of you know a desert or something and there's wind coming from different directions and it's because of its abrasion and its scratching and its erosion erosional process it has converted this rock into this pointed uh, you know uh, face it has like three different faces so right here is 1 2 and 3 and it's quite pointed like rock it has a very sharp point so this kind of a rock is called a dry canter next is uh, this bolson bajada and pediment so bolson is this entire area that we see the whole area is actually what is called a bolson bolson is basically a valley like area in the desert so that this whole place is called bolson now in this bolson uh, we see that you know uh, there this there is this space in between um, so the whole place is bolson like if we call it that i'm talking about a bolson within the bolson this space in between in the between the mountains this plain space that we see here is what is called a bajada bajada and uh, these uh, if we see that you know this these alluvial alluvial cone like structures the alluvial fan that we did in the river uh, depositional landforms similar structure is uh, visible right here at the bottom of the uh you know this uh bound this hill or so so we see that you know that there, there, there are these depositional structures and these are actually called pediments so in the bolson there is a bajada and there's a pediment and sometimes we might find that there might be a small lake also found in the middle of bajada which is called a playa lake so it is a playa right here this this is the playa so if we see that this alluvial fan right here that is shown this is a pediment this part is the bajada and this is a playa and this whole thing is bolson so 
to make it clear, I'm just going to write down this whole thing is Balson. This is Bajada. This is Playa. And this alluvial fan is also called the pediment. So these are the terms. So now we move on to the depositional features. One of the first one is that of a ripple mark. So in the desert, if we see that we might have found these kind of marks and you know they are the first step before the formation of a sand dune. So when the wind is flowing in a certain, you know, this direct in a certain direction, these kind of ripple marks might be formed. Either direction, these kind of ripple marks are formed. But then comes the sand dunes. So sand dunes are of several types. The first one is a uh, is a Bar Barkan dune. So what happens is when the wind is flowing is in this direction, the uh, uh, what will happen is that you know the 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 sand particles will will get deposited. Uh, in this in this manner and eventually uh, when the when the top would be when you know the sand particles would be at quite a height it will not be able to sustain that height and eventually fall off you know from this side so when it falls off from this side a crescent like shape is formed and this kind of a sand dune is called a barkan dune barkan dune so this this is a barkan dune so when the direction is like this the crescent shape is going to be like this but sometimes what happens is that there is going to be a vegetation on this, this side, on the other side. So suppose the wind is flowing in this manner, but there is a tree here. So it doesn't get a chance, The you know, the sand doesn't get a chance to go further ahead. And because of that, it is going to uh, stop right before the tree. And then, you know, everything else is going to get accumulated like this. So if the crescent is in this shape, when the wind is flowing this side, that is called a parabolic dune. So right here, if we see that here is the parabolic dune, it is also crescent shaped, but the crescent is facing the other side. Then uh, there is a transverse dune. So transverse dune is, you know, mostly sometimes after the uh, Barkan dune. So after, you know, long time after this has happened, it's going to keep, uh, you know, the wind is going to keep blowing in this side. And eventually all of this is going to line up to form such a kind of dune which is called a uh, transverse dune. And then there is also going to be, see right here is even an example shown that how it is becoming uh, transverse. So initially it will become like this and then, then suddenly after that it is going to form into something like this. And then the last one is star dune. So when you know the wind is blowing from three directions every from everywhere the sand is going to get accumulated in the middle and this kind of a star like dune is formed which is called a star dune so if you see the images this is a barkan barkan dune so if you see that right here is the crescent and the wind is going to be blowing from this side this is how a transverse dune looks like so if you see that this could have been a barkan dune someday this is what i'm talking about. these are ripple marks i'm not talking about these this is what is a transverse dune. Someday it could have been that this would have been a Barkhan dune, but eventually because of years of wind blowing, it has turned into a transverse dune. This is a parabolic dune right here. If you see the crescent is on this side, the wind is blowing from here. And because of vegetation, the sand cannot go further ahead. So this is a parabolic dune. These are longitudinal dunes. Longitudinal dunes is when, when the wind is blowing in this side. So actually I did not, uh, I think, uh, go through that in this diagram. Okay, so uh, when the wind is blowing in this direction, the dunes are going to, uh, you know, form parallel to one another. And uh, that's when uh, such longitudinal dunes are also formed. So they are actually quite similar to the uh, the ripple marks but you know these are the longitudinal dunes the next one is the star dune so right here if you see that you know the wind is coming from all the directions at least three directions four directions and which is why such a star like structure is formed which is called a star dune Lois is actually the final uh, depositional land formed by the action of wind so what happens is that all the uh, you know all the sediments that wind is carrying eventually as the grasslands are closed 
it's going to deposit all of that material in that uh, new place where you know there is resistance and so uh, all that deposited material that has come from you know all the different rocks it is quite uh, you know it is mineral rich and everything and it is new soil so similar to the alluvial soil that comes from different mountain ranges and the action of rivers this is also quite fertile because it is coming also from the different rocks but it is coming because of wind and which is why this kind of loess is often used for the agriculture purposes so we are done with the wind landforms as well now we move on to the glacial landforms so in glacial landform one of the most important landform is a u shaped valley so in rivers we saw a v shaped valley because the water is going to cut vertically because it has great speed and uh, it is it has a lot of energy as well but a glacier is not going to have as much energy it is going to flow very slowly and because of that it is going to form a u shaped valley instead of a v shaped valley so right here is an example of a u shaped valley now sometimes like just like rivers they have different tributaries that are you know meeting the v shaped that are meeting the main rivers uh so you know they also form their own v shaped valleys here in glacial landforms there's going to be a glacier again which is going to be meeting the main glacier and this glacier the you know tributary glacier is also going to form a u shaped valley but since it is not doing a lot of vertical erosion it is not going to be often at the same height uh, of the main glacier trough so what happens is that you know it is going to be a uh, quite a bit at a height from the glacier the from the main glacier and it forms a hanging valley so right here if you see this is the example of a hanging valley so if it would have been a river it would have been you know it would have cut so much that a, a river would be directly meeting the water here but since it's a glacier it is a u shaped valley here as well and it is hanging and you know water is coming from here so that's a hanging valley now the next landform that we are going to do is corey or circue so what happens is sometimes that uh, you know there's a mountain peak on which there is a there's a glacier now a glacier as it erodes the mountain peak it might uh, you know as we saw here that it might it is forming a hollow here it's forming a u shaped valley similarly even on the mountain side that it is accumulated it might form a hollow so a hollow or a chair like structure so if we see right here this is what it is what is called circue circue is also called as corey so it might look something like this this is a circue right here so it is called circue or corey another a uh, landform is that as circue or a corey is formed what happens sometimes is that you know it the glacier is eroded this part also it has formed a corey right here it has formed a corey right here or it might be a you know it might not be a hollow but it might be like a flat structure but glacier has eroded it which is why this part if you see it is sharpened quite a bit and it is dividing two different sides of the mountain so this sharp edge sharp ridge like structure is called an arete so this is an arete this is a circue or a corey and this peak is what is called a horn so this is a horn this is a circue and this is a corey next is a tarn lake now what happens sometimes is that the hollow that is formed in the corey or in the circue is going to be a little bit deeper and small lakes are going to be formed here so this is what is a tarn lake if we see right here in the corey there is a lake and it is called a tarn lake so it looks something like this see this is a corey of a, a mountain and right here is the lake and this is the tarn lake sometimes such lakes are going to be you know many lakes in the around the same region so if we see this is also a circue or a corey and there are this one lake lake second lake third lake fourth lake so there are two three lakes you know very close by one another in the corey itself and these lakes are called paternoster lakes so they appear something like this this is a paternoster lake all of these are paternoster lakes next is kettle holes so as we saw potholes in the action of river during the waterfall 
uh, similarly you know similar action happens with the glacier as well and such holes are called kettle holes next is esker so as we saw natural levees in the river where you know the uh, flow of the river after the flooding it was kind of forming like a boundary to the river so that the flood water does not go out those natural depositional levees were formed similar action is happening in the um, glaciers as well but glaciers uh, the the depositions that it leaves uh, up you know to the side towards the side of its path is called an esker rather than a uh, levee so this is an esker right here this is how it looks like so this you know there might be a glacier here there might be a glacier here and this is what is what it has left on the side sometimes what happens is that you know there are such uh, eskers uh, or such ridges but you know the glacier movement might not have been a straight movement it could have been a little uh, you know meander it had it might have meandered a little and it might have formed such broken ridges so right here right here if you see there are you know there's there are some breaks in between and that's what is called a cane canes these are canes so moraines are you know these brown depositional features so or uh, the sediments that are left behind by a glacial uh, by a glacier is what is called moraines now sometimes a glacier is trying to flow in a certain direction and you know uh, there might be a bedrock which might be of a little bit more height than the regular plain land and if it is a, a little bit of a you know more height the glacier might kind of try it might get accumulated here and then eventually it might reach here then here and then eventually it might you know cover this entire bedrock so uh, you know it might stay so sometimes you know the glacier from the top it might move but you know this a bit of it might still stay on the bedrock because it might be holding the glacier with it and uh, it might form an inverted boat like feature so it might look something like this and that's what is called a drumlin so nunatak nunatak is uh, like an island so it is you know in island we see that it's a piece of land just surrounded by water on all the sides nunatak is similar but instead of water it is surrounded by glacier on all the sides so right here if we see this is a piece of land and it is surrounded by glacier on all of its sides so these were all the landforms that we needed to study for the prelims and we are done with the geomorphology as well now in the coming week i am going to try and finish the entire climatology in i want to do it in one session itself if i am unable to do in one session then for sure in two sessions but i am hoping that in the next week itself we are done with the climatology and then oceanology i am sure that i can finish off in one session and after that i want to move on to indian geography as soon as possible so i hope you find these videos useful if you do please leave a comment below and leave a thumbs up because it really encourages me uh and if you have not subscribed to my channel yet please subscribe thank you so much for watching this video